Chapter 30 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 1, translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombel. Chapter 30 Doctrines of the Ophites and Sethians. 1. Others, again, portentously declare that there exists, in the power of Bythus, a certain primary light, blessed, incorruptible, and infinite. This is the father of all, and is styled the first man. They also maintain that his Enoia, going forth from him, produced a son, and that this is the son of man, the second man. Below these, again, is the Holy Spirit, and under this superior spirit, the elements were separated from each other, viz. water, darkness, the abyss, chaos, above which they declare the spirit was born, calling him the first woman. Afterwards they maintain, the first man, with his son, delighting over the beauty of the spirit, that is, of the woman, and shedding light upon her, begat by her an incorruptible light, the third male, whom they call Christ, the son of the first and second man, and of the Holy Spirit, the first woman. 2. The father and the son, thus, both had intercourse with the woman, whom they also call the mother of the living. When, however, she could not bear nor receive into herself the greatness of the lights, they declare that she was filled to repletion, and became ebullient on the left side, and that thus their only son Christ, as belonging to the right side, and never tending to what was higher, was immediately caught up with his mother to form an incorruptible ion. This constitutes the true and holy church, which has become the appellation, the meeting together, and the union of the father of all, of the first man, of the son, of the second man, of Christ their Son, and of the woman who has been mentioned. 3. They teach, however, that the power which proceeded from the woman by ebullition, being besprinkled with light, fell downward from the place occupied by its progenitors, yet possessing by its own will that besprinkling of light, and it they call Sinistra, Prunicus, and Sophia, as well as masculo-feminine. This being, in its simplicity, descended into the waters while they were yet in a state of immobility, and imparted motion to them also, wantingly acting upon them even to their lowest depths, and assumed from them a body. For they affirm that all things rushed towards and clung to that sprinkling of light, and begirt it all around. Unless it had possessed that, it would perhaps have been totally absorbed in, and overwhelmed by, material substance. Being therefore bound down by a body which was composed of matter, and greatly burdened by it, this power regretted the course it had followed, and made an attempt to escape from the waters and ascend to its mother. It could not effect this, however, on account of the weight of the body lying over and around it. But feeling very ill at ease, it endeavored at least to conceal that light which came from above, fearing lest it too might be injured by the inferior elements, as had happened to itself. And when it had received power from that besprinkling of light which it possessed, it sprang back again, and was borne aloft, and being on high, it extended itself, covered a portion of space, and formed this visible heaven out of its body, yet remained under the heaven which it made, as still possessing the form of a watery body. But when it had conceived a desire for the light above, and had received power by all things, it laid down this body, and was freed from it. This body which they speak of that power as having thrown off, they call a female from a female. 4. They declare, moreover, 
that her son had also himself a certain breath of incorruption left him by his mother, and that through means of it he works. And becoming powerful, he himself, as they affirm, also sent forth from the waters a son without a mother, for they do not allow him either to have known a mother. His son, again, after the example of his father, sent forth another son. This third one, too, generated a fourth. The fourth also generated a son. They maintain that again a son was generated by the fifth, and the sixth, too, generated a seventh. Thus was the hebdomad, according to them, completed. The mother, possessing the eighth place, and as in the case of their generations, so also in regard to dignities and powers, they precede each other in turn. 5. They have also given names to the several persons in their system of falsehood, such as the following. He who was the first descendant of the mother is called Ialdabaoth. He again, descended from him, is named Io. He, from this one, is called Sabaoth. The fourth is named Adonius, the fifth Elius, the sixth Oreus, and the seventh and last of all Astenphius. Moreover, they represent these heavens, potentates, powers, angels, and creators, as sitting in their proper order in heaven, according to their generation, and as invisibly ruling over things celestial and terrestrial. The first of them, namely Ialdabaoth, holds his mother in contempt, inasmuch as he produced sons and grandsons without the permission of any one, yea, even angels, archangels, powers, potentates, and dominions. After these things had been done, his sons turned to strive and quarrel with him about the supreme power, conduct which deeply grieved Ialdabaoth, and drove him to despair. In these circumstances, he cast his eyes upon the subjacent dregs of matter, and fixed his desire upon it, to which they declare his son owes his origin. This son is Naus himself, twisted into the form of a serpent, and hence were derived the spirit, the soul, and all mundane things. From this too were generated all oblivion, wickedness, emulation, envy, and death. They declare that the father imparted still greater crookedness to this serpent-like and contorted nous of theirs, when he was with their father in heaven and paradise. 6. On this account, Ialdabaoth, becoming uplifted in spirit, boasted himself over all those things that were below him, and exclaimed, I am father and God! and above me there is no one. But his mother, hearing him speak thus, cried out against him, Do not lie, Ialdabaoth, for the father of all, the first Anthropos, is above thee, and so is Anthropos, the son of Anthropos. Then, as all were disturbed by this new voice, and by the unexpected proclamation, and as they were inquiring whence the noise proceeded, in order to lead them away and attract them to himself, they affirm that Ialdabaoth exclaimed, Come, let us make a man after our image. The six powers, on hearing this, and their mother furnishing them with the idea of a man, in order that by means of him she might empty them of their original power, jointly formed a man of immense size, both in regard to breadth and length. But as he could merely writhe along the ground, they carried him to their father, Sophia so laboring in this matter, that she might empty him, that is, Ialdabaoth, of the light with which he had been sprinkled, so that he might no longer, though still powerful, be able to lift himself against the powers above. They declare, then, that by breathing into man the spirit of life, he was secretly emptied of his power, that hence man became a possessor of nous, or intelligence, and enthymesis, or thought, 
and they affirm that these are the faculties which partake in salvation. He, they further assert, at once gave thanks to the first Anthropos, forsaking those who had created him. 7. But Ialdabaoth, feeling envious at this, was pleased to form the design and again emptying man by means of woman, and proceeded a woman from his own enthymesis, whom that Pronicus, mentioned above, laying hold of, imperceptibly emptied her of power. But the others coming and admiring her beauty, named her Eve, and falling in love with her, begat sons by her, whom they also declare to be the angels. But their mother, Sophia, cunningly devised a scheme to seduce Eve and Adam, by means of the serpent, to transgress the command of Ialdabaoth. Eve listened to this, as if it had proceeded from a son of God, and yielded an easy belief. She also persuaded Adam to eat of the tree regarding which God had said that they should not eat of it. They then declare that, on their thus eating, they attained to the knowledge of that power which is above all, and departed from those who had created them. When Prunicus perceived that the powers were thus baffled by their own creature, she greatly rejoiced, and again cried out, that since the father was incorruptible, he, that is, Ialdabaoth, who formerly called himself the father, was a liar, and that, while Anthropos and the first woman, being the spirit, existed previously, this one, being Eve, sinned by committing adultery. 8. Ialdabaoth, however, through that oblivion in which he was involved, and not paying any regard to these things, cast Adam and Eve out of paradise, because they had transgressed his commandment. For he had a desire to beget sons by Eve, but did not accomplish his wish, because his mother opposed him in every point, and secretly emptied Adam and Eve of the light with which they had been sprinkled, in order that that spirit which proceeded from the supreme power might participate neither in the curse nor opprobrium caused by transgression. They also teach that, thus being emptied of the divine substance, they were cursed by him and cast down from heaven to this world. But the serpent also, who was acting against the father, was cast down by him into this lower world. He reduced, however, under his power the angels here, and begat six sons, he himself forming the seventh person, after the example of that hebdomad which surrounds the father. They further declare that these are the seven mundane demons, who always oppose and resist the human race, because it was on their account that their father was cast down to this lower world. 9. Adam and Eve previously had light, and clear, and as it were, spiritual bodies, which, as they were at their creation. But when they came to this world, they changed into bodies more opaque, and gross, and sluggish. Their soul also was feeble and languid, inasmuch as they had received from their Creator a merely mundane inspiration. This continued until Prunicus, moved with compassion towards them, restored to them the sweet savor of the besprinkling of light, by means of which they came to a remembrance of themselves, and knew that they were naked, as well as that the body was a material substance, and thus recognized that they bore death about with them. They thereupon became patient, knowing that only for a time they would be enveloped in the body. They also found out food through the guidance of Sophia, and when they were satisfied, they had carnal knowledge of each other, and begat Cain, whom the serpent, that had been cast down along with his sons, immediately laid hold of, and destroyed by filling him with mundane oblivion, and urging him into folly and audacity, so that, by slaying his brother Abel, he was the first to bring to light envy and death. After these, they affirm that, 
by the forethought of Prunicus, Seth was begotten, and then Norea, from whom they represent all the rest of mankind as being descended. They were urged on to all kinds of wickedness by the inferior Hebdomad, and to apostasy, idolatry, and a general contempt of everything by the superior holy Hebdomad, since the mother was always secretly opposed to them, and carefully preserved what was peculiarly her son, that is, the besprinkling of light. They maintain, moreover, that the Hebdomad is the seven stars which they call planets, and they affirm that the serpent cast down has two names, Michael and Samael. 10. Ialdabaoth, again, being incensed with men, because they did not worship or honor him as father and god, sent forth a deluge upon them, that he might at once destroy them all. But Sophia opposed him in this point also, and Noah and his family were saved in the ark by means of the besprinkling of that light which proceeded from her. And through it the world was again filled with mankind. Ialdabaoth himself chose a certain man named Abraham from among these, and made a covenant with him, to the effect that, if his seed continued to serve him, he would give to them the earth for an inheritance. Afterwards, by means of Moses, he brought forth Abraham's descendants from Egypt, and gave them the law, and made them the Jews. Among that people he chose seven days, which they also call the Holy Hebdomad, each of these receives his own herald for the purpose of glorifying and proclaiming God, so that, when the rest hear these praises, they too may serve those who are announced as gods by the prophets. 11. Moreover, they distribute the prophets in the following manner. Moses and Joshua the son of Nun, and Amos and Habakkuk, belonged to Ialdabaoth, Samuel and Nathan, and Jonah and Micah to Io, Elijah, Joel, and Zechariah to Sabaoth, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Daniel to Adonai, Tobias and Haggai to Eloi, Micaiah and Nahum to Oreus, Esdras and Zephaniah to Astenphaius. Each one of these, then, glorifies his own father and God and they maintain that Sophia herself has also spoken many things through them regarding the first Anthropos, and concerning that Christ who is above, thus admonishing and reminding men of the incorruptible light, the first Anthropos, and of the descent of Christ. The other powers, being terrified by these things, and marveling at the novelty of those things which were announced by the prophets, Prunicus brought it about by means of Ialdabaoth, who knew not what he did, that emissions of two men took place, the one from the barren Elizabeth, and the other from the Virgin Mary. 12. And since she herself had no rest, either in heaven or on earth, she invoked her mother to assist her in her distress. Upon this, her mother, the first woman, was moved with compassion towards her daughter on her repentance, and begged from the first man that Christ should be sent to her assistance, who, being sent forth, descended with his sister to the besprinkling of light, when he recognized her, that is, the Sophia below, her brother descended to her, and announced his advent through means of John, and prepared the baptism of repentance and adopted Jesus beforehand, in order that, on Christ descending, he might find a pure vessel, and that by the son of that Ialdabaoth, the woman might be announced by Christ. They further declare that he descended through the seven heavens, having assumed the likeness of their sons, and gradually emptied them of their power. For they maintain that the whole besprinkling of light rushed to him, and that Christ, descending to this world, first clothed his sister Sophia with it, and that then both exulted in the mutual refreshment they felt in each other's society. 
This scene they describe as relating to bridegroom and bride. But Jesus, inasmuch as he was begotten of the virgin through the agency of God, was wiser, purer, and more righteous than all other men. Christ, united to Sophia, descended into him, and thus Jesus Christ was produced. 13. They affirm that many of his disciples were not aware of the descent of Christ into him, but that, when Christ did descend on Jesus, he then began to work miracles, and heal, and announce the unknown Father, and openly to confess himself the son of the first man. The powers and the father of Jesus were angry at these proceedings, and labored to destroy him, and when he was being led away for this purpose, they say that Christ himself, along with Sophia, departed from him into the state of an incorruptible ion, while Jesus was crucified. Christ, however, was not forgetful of his Jesus, and sent down a certain energy into him from above, which raised him up again in the body, which they call both animal and spiritual, for he sent the mundane parts back again into the world. When his disciples saw that he had risen, they did not recognize him, no, not even Jesus himself, by whom he rose again from the dead. And they assert that this very great error prevailed among his disciples, that they imagined he had risen in a mundane body, not knowing that flesh and blood do not attain to the kingdom of God. 14. They strove to establish the descent and ascent of Christ, by the fact that neither before his baptism, nor after his resurrection from the dead, do his disciples state that he did any mighty works, not being aware that Jesus was united to Christ, and the incorruptible ion to the hebdomad. And they declare his mundane body to be of the same nature as that of animals. But after his resurrection, he tarried on earth eighteen months, and knowledge descending into him from above, he taught what was clear. He instructed a few of his disciples, whom he knew to be capable of understanding so great mysteries, in these things and was then received up into heaven, Christ sitting down at the right hand of his father Ialdabaoth, that they may receive to himself the souls of those who have known them, after they have laid aside their mundane flesh, thus enriching himself without the knowledge or perception of his father, so that, in proportion as Jesus enriches himself with holy souls, to such an extent does his father suffer loss and is diminished, being emptied of his own power by these souls. For he will not now possess holy souls to send them down again into the world, except those only which are of his substance, that is, those into which he has breathed. But the consummation of all things will take place when the whole besprinkling of the spirit of light is gathered together and is carried off to form an incorruptible ion. 15. Such are the opinions which prevail among these persons, by whom, like the Lernaean Hydra, a many-headed beast has been generated from the school of Valentinus. For some of them assert that Sophia herself became the serpent, on which account she was hostile to the creator of Adam, and implanted knowledge in men, for which reason the serpent was called wiser than all others. Moreover, by the position of our intestines, through which the food is conveyed, and by the fact that they possess such a figure, our internal configuration in the form of a serpent reveals our hidden generatrix. End of Book 1, Chapter 30